I knew very, very well Congo because uh, I was not born there, but uh, I lived there because my father was uh, in, on duty there as a governor, a province governor, uh, during many, many years. So um, I know a lot about, uh, especially the Kasai province and the Katanga province, where my father was on duty. And um, also, um, uh, I know the, their languages, and I'm still interested in uh, what's happening in Congo. And still now, uh, I'm as an ex expert at the cabinet of the Minister of Cooperation. And uh, I go very much to, to Congo, uh, let's say um, almost once a month, uh, to, do, to try to, or should I say, to um, rehabilitate, rehabilitate the transportation problems in Congo right now. Uh, my father wanted that I, I made the studies in Belgium, and so I was uh, sent back to Belgium to study in Belgium. And by the time uh, he asked me what I wanted to do, I just wanted to do the same thing he did. Uh, that is to say, he went to the um, university, the colonial university in Antwerp, and I wanted to do the same. And he said to me, no, no, don't do that, because by the time you will finish your studies, it will be the inhabitants here in Congo, and uh, you won't have a job here. So if you want to come back to Congo, um, try the military way. And that's why I'm in the military. And so I went to the Royal Military Academy and uh, I finished my studies there and I had the chance to go back to Congo as a military. And that, uh, before the independence, I uh, lived the complete time of the independence until after independence and even after what happened in Katanga. Mm -hmm. So as a military, I'm, uh, I had a lot of experience of that time. Can you tell us a little bit about the, the period right prior to independence, the events that led up to that, and then a little bit about independence in 60, and then um, what happened after that um, in terms of um, the military? Well, uh, before the, the independence, uh, before the independence, you must know, and the colonel will explain it to you much better than I can do, because he was longer than I was in the, in the First Republic. <coughs> the First Republic was divided in two, Two big, two big, uh, let's say, uh, entities. One was the defense of Congo. This, the, this was the defense forces, the combat forces, and the other one was uh, the territorial service. And this was, uh, let's say, lo some kind of gendarmerie, uh, local local police, not uh, not uh, not not uh, city police, but the local in internal police to keep peace and order inside the country. And uh, let's say that the young, youngest soldiers and, uh, and graduates and let's say sergeants and uh, so on, they were in, into service of the combat units during a certain period of time and then moved to the territorial service. This worked perfectly. This was working very, very, very good until the, the, the years and the months before the independence when uh, they started, the Congolese started to feel that the colonial authority was going down. And uh, when your, the authority of the colonial author authorities was, uh, was getting down, it was easy for them to get back to their ancient uh, tribal rivalries. And uh, so the mo one of the most uh, intense uh, tribal rivalry was in the Kasai province where the Luluas and the Balubas had a, 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 the long fights against each other, terrible fight. And so in the beginning, the territorial forces was, were, uh, or should I say, uh, they had to, to keep peace and order when it was possible. But after that, because it was not enough, the combat forces had to, to, to be, to be bring in, uh, brought in. Uh, I myself, I was in, a, let's say, in a reconnaissance unit, uh, an armor unit, and uh, I had a lot of uh, operations to do in the Kasai province uh, because the, the local territorial units were not enough uh, to keep with this this problem. So that's that's one of the problems. The rest was uh, the the political problems of uh, the leaders, the leaders getting their their, should I say, their, 
their motivation from outside the Congo, from Ghana, uh, even from from Czechoslovakia at that time, maybe from Russia. Uh, Russia I don't know. And uh, this made up that uh, during this month it was very difficult to keep the law and order in Congo. Uh, there were very many manifestations, you, you know about that, uh, about the history of uh, uh, January uh, 58. And uh, after that, after January 58, well, Belgium decided too quickly and uh, without um, thinking. Uh, a little bit ahead to grant the the independence of the 30th of, of June, nay, 30th of June, 60. Uh, this was, in fact, as you, I, I, I will be very, very, maybe very strong about that. This was a political, uh, should I say, that all politicians in Belgium were very happy to get rid of Congo. Uh, you must know that in Belgium, not everybody was for, uh, was happy to have this colony. Not everybody. I would say uh, uh, I should say that the majority of the people were not happy to have this colony, and that they, they don't care. They, they they didn't care about the colony. And so, when the government decided too quick and without reflection and without uh, uh, a vision of the, the the future, to give them their independence in in six months. Well, uh, uh, I must say that all politicians in Belgium were very happy, and maybe the people were very happy. And this was a signal to the population inside the, uh, Congo to say, OK, they are leaving us. We don't have to obey anymore. Uh, we will be go back to our own our law and order of, uh, of before the arrival of the colonialists. And that's why it, it was very difficult to keep law and order until the last day. And that's one of the reasons why the, the Force Publique get, uh, got into mutiny in the beginning of July, because the, the step over from a colonial army to uh, uh, the army of an independent state was not prepared enough. That's my opinion. I don't know if the colonel is, has the same opinion. I, I understand that you understand everything. Yes. I don't know if he has the same opinion. But to me, it was not prepared. I was a young second lieutenant, like I told you. Uh, it was not prepared at all. And, uh, and I have a, a great respect for General Janssen, who was the command, command, commander of the Force Public. When he wrote on the blackboard, before the independence equaled after the, the independence, in my opinion, it was a great mistake, bef before, because it was not the same. It was uh, completely not the same. And uh, no, uh, I don't know why, but nobody explained it uh, to the, the black soldiers. And we had no orders to explain it. Just we had the orders to say to them, there is no difference. But to them, there was a difference. There was a difference because they saw civilians coming from nothing, let's say nothing, to being prime minister. Pri the prime minister was, was in prison, and they, 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 these soldiers had to take him out of prison to, to bring him uh, to, to his uh, function as prime minister. Uh, and they, they, had, they had nothing, no nothing. And then they started, uh, the, the authorities, the Congolese authorities started by the beginning of July to give everybody a rank more. This was not enough. That, this was not the idea. This was not what they wanted. They wanted to be uh, acquainted, they, they wanted to be recognized as members of the army of an independent state of which they didn't know what it was. Nobody explained them what it was. Nobody. And because nobody explained them, maybe some officers in some camps have explained uh, to them what, what was going to happen and what was going to be the future, maybe, maybe. But there was no real order, instruction, no, no real uh, booklet to explain to or, or Congolese soldiers what was going to happen and what was going to be the independence. And that's why uh, I think that's one of the more the, one of the reasons of the the mutiny. I had a talk with General Jansen a couple of days, a couple of weeks before 
the independence. And I told him, if you don't change, because <coughs> why did I do so? I knew him. And <coughs> as a son of a governor, I, I maybe in, in, let's say, in, in private, private circle, I may, uh, had maybe the opportunity to <coughs> to tell him what what was not possible outside, and I told him, if you don't change and if you don't explain, you are going straight to a mutiny, to a revolution, into the army. He said, no, if you talk this this language again, you can have your ticket, Sabina ticket, and you go back to Belgium. Uh, and why did I say that? Because my assistant, uh, he was uh, Sergeant Major uh, Muloko, told me, uh, Lieutenant, Lieutenant, bring your wife back to Belgium. She's pregnant. Send, send her to Belgium. Send your, your things to Belgium and remain here with us as long as you can. But there will be something and uh, there will be a revolution. So don't uh, take this uh, risk, risk with your wife, send her back. He said that to me, Muloko. Muloko died years after that in the revolution. He was a very good uh, war officer. He was a very good one. And uh, I told this to the general, and he didn't believe me. He didn't believe me. He said, you can have your ticket, and you can go back. So I remained. <laughs> I myself am telling about my story. I remained there. Uh, he didn't, but I remained there until uh, 62, uh, even 63. And uh, what happened after that was that uh, after the, the the mutiny, well, we had to fight against our own soldiers. This was terrible, you know. Mm -hmm. This was uh, very terrible to say to them, OK, uh, this is a line there, a stripe there, and uh, you are not going over this tribe, we are shooting to you. This was terrible. And uh, in Katanga, we were in Katanga. And after that, uh, Katanga was declared independent. And uh, uh, well, all the soldiers were made prisoners. And uh, they had to choose to remain in Katanga, in the Katangese army, which was called Gendarmerie, or to go back to their own country in the north, uh, all over Congo, what most of them did. And we started again a new army. On, we had to fight against the national army. Uh, from time to time, we were confronted uh, Belgian officers on, what, on one side with the Cantonese army and Belgian officers on the other side <laughs> with the national army. But uh, in fact, uh, we didn't fight each, each other at that time uh, and, and that way. Well, that's the, that's the story, until the time that the United Nations declared that uh, because the independence of Katanga must uh, take an end. And um, this was the first war from United Nations against Katangi's army, and they lose it. Uh, we won it by that time. And the second time, they, they brought in a lot of uh, uh, reinforcements, and uh, it was not possible to to resist to the, the power of uh, Ethiopians, uh, Gurkhas, whatever, the, what else, I don't remember. And uh, well, K the Katangese independence was, uh, was finished at that time. But curiously, uh, Chombe, the president of Katanga, was called back uh, into power in the years 64-65. Uh, and then Mobutu took, took power over and uh, Chombe was killed. That's another story. But just to say that um, these years were very difficult to, <laughs> with, with the, if you look at, at after so many years, you say it was very interesting, but it was also very, very dangerous. And uh, uh, many of us have been killed. I mean, I mean when I say us, yes, I'm speaking about uh, Belgian officers and warrant officers have been killed. Most of us have been uh, um, injured uh, because we had, to, we had to fight, that's all. Um, before, before that happened, um, I'm sure at some point you could feel things really starting to boil under the surface before, uh, uh, you could feel the tension uh, before things happened. At what point did you start to notice that there was sort of a change in the, in the society and that there was trouble brewing? 
Well, in fact, I think until, uh, unless the colonel will, will see it, uh, because I, I tell you again, he, he has more experience than I have uh, on, uh, on this time, because I arrived in 50s, I have as officer in 57. Before that, I was there as a young boy, though, so I didn't care about the political evolution, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I arrived there in 1957, yes. Um, to say what we felt as colonialists um, until brackets at that time was that, uh, in fact, in, in the smaller cities and post, there was no change. The people were still living like like they were, and they they, they still agree agreed on uh, on the authority of the territorial uh, commissioner and uh, the military lo local authority uh, and their their own chiefs, their own custom chiefs. So there was <coughs> in the small cities there was nothing to see, but in larger cities, especially in Kinshasa, which was called Leopoldville at the time, or Kisangani, maybe or even Lubumbashi, uh, there, there were signs uh, of uh, a will to evaluate through independence because of the influence of outside countries, uh, straight to those people who were, let's say, intellectual more developed than inside the country. Inside the country, even if you go back today in small in small cities where I have been uh, last month, even you, they they want you, they want you back. They say, okay, come back, please. We are starving. If you come back, well, we, we can eat and we can work and we have we have we have to do in small countries in in small cities like Ilebo, even like Bandaka. Um, Kamina, uh, 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 Kalemie, they ask for you huh? today. Wow. So they, they, they ask for you, you as a colonialist, you know? Even the youngers, the, the, the young boys and the young girls. Uh -huh. you, 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 if you show yourself, they, they haven't seen a, a white figure uh, since months, since years. Uh -huh. Uh, and some some places I was in Ilebo, they, 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 <laughs> I was I was back there, and uh, they know my name uh, as uh, as my father was governor there, and they know my name, and I know the especially the the emperor of the Bakubas. He called himself emperor, and his people said say to him em emperor, the enemy of the Bakubas is a friend, and uh, I was with him, and it was not him that they applauded, but. Me, as a as a white as a white person, they said, okay, he will give us work, he will give us uh, to eat, and uh, we are starving right now, and they they are full hope of the return of white people. Uh, I was sent to Congo many times to cooperate and to, <coughs> or should I say, in the time of Mobutu's regime. In the year '69, uh, I had the, had the mission to start up the military academies of Congo. So I started the military academy for young officers. At the same time, I started also the, their command and general staff college in, in Kinshasa, the academy in the military academy in Kananga, which is as you mean, as you think, and as you may think, it's uh, almost completely destroyed. Mm -hmm. Um, what were uh, some of the um, challenges in uh, establishing this new, what were some of the challenges that you faced in establishing this new uh, training facility? Well, the most challenges uh, were to, to get the spaces, uh, the spaces available. This was not really a big challenge, but uh, the most challenge was to repair the spaces because after the colonies, the colony, this uh, this military training centers, they did exist. In fact, they were almost destroyed by occupying forces. Uh, I must say, by <laughs> occupying forces of uh, the United Nations, especially in Kananga, by the Tunisians. They they they, they destroyed everything, unless the the walls. The rest was completely destroyed. So we had we had uh, to rebuild everything to make it livable, uh, and and it was made in let's say in less than three months. We we, we were able to do it, 
because at that time Mobutu had a lot of money and he spent this money to rebuild this country. We are in 69, he is not ready, he, is not, uh, he has not uh, the idea of getting the money for himself, he is, he is still in the idea, he means still in the idea of spending the money of Congo to uh, promote and to correct the, the living of, uh, of his people at that time, at that time. Uh, five years after that, he changed. He was changing completely, and uh, the money was getting in his pocket and not in the, in, not uh, spread out over the country. So at that time, we had uh, we had money to rebuild these uh, school facilities in Kananga, and we had also money to uh, rebuild the school facilities uh, in Kinshasa and to make it to make it to uh, a, let's say a command and general staff college at that at that time, with money coming only from Mobutu. No franc, no dollar, uh, no nothing came from Belgium or from the United States. No nothing. Huh? Well, uh, well we, transported, we transported everything from Kinshasa to, to Kananga by airplanes. And these airplanes were delivered by um, a CIA uh, outfit, which was called uh, Wigmo at that time. They had transportation. Uh, the transportation aircrafts, but they, are, uh, they had also combat <laughs> helicopters and combat uh, airplanes. But uh, besides that, they had a transportation uh, uh, capacity, and the WIGMO was, in fact, uh, let's say, an institution from the CIA, uh, which was uh, on the service of Mobutu at that time. I'm speaking about the years 68, uh, 69, 70, 71. And then uh, he, ch he was changing his mind, and uh, by changing his mind, well, he, he started to, to see that um, his interest, his personal interest, was, uh, were more in uh, getting the money to himself and his family than uh, to dis distribute it to, to, the, to the country and to the people. And that's uh, what's happening with all dictators in Africa, all of them. All of them have the same, the same way of thinking and doing. Oh, I was... No, you're fine, you're fine. <laughs> Uh, how how does it compare? Because you've been there in a, several time periods. Now you go back once a month. Once now, a month, only. Yeah. Yes. So compare the, today's Congo to in '69. Oh, to compare Congo from of today to '69, there is there is no comparison possible because Congo is completely destroyed compared to '69. '69 was still the train, the train of the colonialism of the colony. Uh, running out, you know, and everything was almost there. All, almost what the colony had built was almost there, and uh, but the train of the colony was was running out. You know? uh, but at this time, the train has stopped, is destroyed. There is no train anymore, and uh, dur during this year, from '70 until now, everything everything was not managed, and uh, everything they had wars, they had uh, revolutions. Uh, the changing of governments and uh, everything what what you can uh, you can call and at this time Congo is a, dis a destroyed country completely destroyed there is no roads the roads are completely destroyed there is no tra uh, railway transportation from time to time it runs there is uh, you have the big uh, uh, stream Congo River which was um, let's say a vein uh, for transportation of goods and person uh, through through Congo, this is not working anymore. Uh, you have the, the air arbors, the, the only arbor, the sea arbor that they have is Matadi, and Matadi is completely uh, completely locked up. And um, what we are trying now is first of thing to deliver Matadi of uh, too much goods over there. The second thing is to rehabilitate the, the railroad between Matadi and Kinshasa, which is not working. Uh, third thing is to rehabilitate the, the traffic along the Congo River, because this is a very easy to, to realize. Uh, third, fourth thing is to rehabilitate some arbors along the river, like Kinshasa, Mbalnaka, Kisangani, Ilebo. Those arbors were, were working very good until until eighty seven, uh, but uh, they are no uh, they are no dead, uh, completely dead. It's very difficult because the corruption is so uh, immense in in Congo. 
that uh, because he, even you, you can start anything to do with them, uh, you should pay them. We arrived last year with a new, a new proposal. We said, okay, we will, you ask us what you want. They, they didn't know what they wanted. So we said, uh, what you want is this and this and this. We can do that. But, 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 there is one condition. You will never get a cent. Never. You will never see the color of the money. We will pay everything. And we will uh, try to rehabilitate this this uh, this uh, arbors, but you will never see a, a dollar. You will never see a euro. You will never see a cent. And this was not uh, well uh, well agreed by them. They, they 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 thought that they were going to get some money of us, but they, they don't. They don't, and we don't give them. That's a, a new way of doing. Uh, we, um, we want to help you, but we don't trust you. <laughs> That's the reality. Mm -hmm. We don't trust you. And we prefer to do it by ourselves. You can operate these things after that. You operate it good, you operate it bad. It's your business. We, re uh, we rehabilitate it, we build uh, new things, we, we are building new things, but, and you have to operate it. But um, we are not going to give you the money before. Nowadays, um People are, are really concerned about doing the politically correct thing. They're very careful about doing the politically correct thing. Do you think it's... What, what people are you speaking about? Oh, just sort of like culture in general. Like maybe, um, you know, um, culture generally they're worried about. Like they, some people may think of colonization as something in the past. And yeah, so, European, no. European people. Euro European, yeah. European, yeah. Uh, do you think it's... It, is it better... I mean, is it better to try to do the politically correct thing, or if people are asking for food and help, would it be better to just try to get, you know, is it better to try to do the politically correct thing that society says, or is it more important to say people need food <coughs> and so forth, should we just do that? And the politically, politically correct things, uh, for me, it's, it's just words, and it's just an excuse, just to say, uh, excuse me, uh, we did not bad, we did, we did it bad, and uh, we don't want to go to... To, to retry it again, and I am not I am not saying that we must go back to colonialism. We, uh, I am not saying that because uh, after so many years of independence, the the most intellectuals of uh, Congo are aware that uh, that they are that they have an intellectual uh, potential, and uh, they are aware what's independence. The problem is that their mentality is not the same as our, our mentality. Mm. Our mentality is turned to service to the population, service to the people. Their mentality is, is turned to service to myself mm. and service to my, my family, my clan. Mm. Uh, 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 that's, that's, that's their problem. Mm. So they are not turned to service to... Although uh, Mobutu had... Um, uh, he said uh, Mobutu was uh, writing all over the, the, the country, uh, servir, pas se servir, serve, not serve uh, yourself. Ah. And Kabila has taken this, uh, these words to him too, mm -hmm. servir, pas se servir. And uh, that's, this is politically correct, and this is, uh, this is a lie, because it doesn't exist until now. Uh, the, the problem is that uh, finally people outside the Congolese are turning their regards to the, the population, turning their regards to the misery of the population. They try and they try to do something to, to help this population, which is not uh, the case of uh, until now of uh, or should I say the, the, the leaders of Congo. So let's hope that uh, with Kabila, but. Uh, uh, and this new government that uh, for Congo there will be a new era. Mm. But, 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 I'm not sure. Yeah. I'm what, not sure. What's your feeling? You think, do you think there's hope or are you pessimistic? I'm rather pessimistic. Yeah. I'm rather pessimistic because uh, uh, they are not going to change uh, like that. Um, but on the other side, we are not, uh, we are not willing and uh, it's not... Uh, and it's not our will, and it's not more possible to, to say, okay, we are, we are going to colonialize you again. Uh -huh. It's not possible. Which country will accept that? Yeah. 
in the world. But there are people in the a lot of people in the Congo who th who think that would be a good thing, huh? Yes, that's right. Wow. Huh. That's right. Inside the Congo, all inside the Congo, no problem. Interesting. No problem. Huh. Um, what if if you could say if there was a better way to transition to independence back in 1960? Would the what would that better way have been? Just more time for training and so forth? Yes. 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 I think the transition uh, could have been much more better prepared by having a little bit more times. Uh, by the years 55, there was uh, Mr. Van Bilzen who wrote a book, and in this book um, he said that independence will be granted after 30 years. He was writing this in 55. My father said to me, uh, no, this, this will be earlier. I'm, I'm thinking about 60, 65, he said, 60, between 65 and 70. That's why uh, I don't recommend to you to go to the colonial university. Uh, I think that we should have, in accordance with the Congolese political authorities at that time, or politicians at that time, arrange for, let's say, um, a gradual, uh, a, a gradual granting of independence uh, that could have lasted, uh, let's say, five years, but not more, but not lesser, but five years at least the time to 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 train uh, local administrations, administra administration and local uh, commissioners to train uh, army officers and to get uh, a good agreement between Belgium and the Congo to, or should I say, to let them go to their completely independence with our help uh, and with the authority of Belgium uh, going down every year a little bit until it was finished. Mm -hmm. But not in six months. Yeah. This is stupid. This is criminal. And it's, it, it's so. And I'm still, as a Belgian, I'm, I'm saying it was criminal. And that's the... Or should I say, that's why Congo never, never uh, could uh, be really in peace unless during Mobutu's time, let's say 10 years, something like that, but with Mobutu as a dictator. And that's why Congo is still now behind his level of development yet reached in 60 by the independence. And many people say uh, if Congo wants to get back to this, this level of uh, development of, of 60, it will take until 2050. It means 40 years with a growth percentage of two, two marks per year. And this is not possible. They are not going to get it that, that time. And well, you have the same. You have the same with the Portuguese. The Portuguese have done it's something else. They have fight against the independentists, and they lose their fight. And Angola, Angola is at the same at the same level. It's down. And um, other, even French colonies uh, are on the same level. So Central Africa beneath the Sahara is in a very bad shape, a very, very bad shape, because uh, they were granted the independence too early, too rapidly, and without, uh, or should I say, without real preparation. And uh, why was that? Well, um, you must look at your country, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and even a little bit to Russia, and also to Mr. De Gaulle. Mm -hmm. But you must look first to your country, which eager to give their independence because they, you in your country you have had the, the, this this war of 1860, 1865, uh, and this was a terrible war uh, against slavery, and since then the Americans they they want to free everybody, mm -hmm. but you can't free everybody <laughs> without condition, and you can't free it on American conditions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. If you don't know what's happening in a country, don't mix you up with what's happening in this country. Yeah. So is the problem um, that countries like America just aren't uh, aware of the cultures that they're going into? They're, they don't know all the, the subtleties of the culture and they just go in and 
say. And say yes. Yeah. Huh. Free. <laughs> yeah. But no, no, you can't do that. Huh. Uh. Um, uh, what do you think at this point in time the different nations of the world could do to help um, countries in Africa or elsewhere? Is there anything that they could do to help that would be productive rather than counterproductive? Well, I think you can help these countries, uh, but there is there is a condition. There is there is a big condition. This is that you go all around one table, and not around many tables. One table, and uh, you decide that some is the leader of this this conference of this this way of doing, and then you you can get help from from many countries and with a, a leader and a bureau you can start to help this country on the right way this must not be the same table for every country but there are signs to to do such uh, uh, we have in congo the, the idea the idea is coming up from the, the world bank to Realize, uh, realize uh, what they call the, the CAF. It means Country Assistance Framework. This is really a big step forward. Country Assistance Framework, where every uh, donor will be around the same table, and uh, we will discuss about what, what we can do and we, who, who's going to take the lead of this Country Assistance Framework. It must not be Belgium. We don't ask for it. We would like to do it, of course, and I think that uh, many, many people, especially the Americans, will say, okay, you have the experience, take it here, take it over. Okay, fine, with the risks that are connected to taking the, the lead of uh, such um, an institution. But we are ready to do it, but we are not eager to do it. But we are eager to, um, to manage this country assistance framework and we would like to see it created in other countries where the donors, uh, the international donors are present. Because at the present time, you have money coming in from different uh, sources, but not used like it must be used, and spent uh, not like it must be spent, and there is no control. And, uh, and not enough control. I can tell you the, the story of, uh, 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 should I say, uh, in, in the arbor of Kinshasa, where the World Bank was uh, building back some part of the arbor. And when I came there to see this work, I, I saw a difference of five centimeters of, between what does exist and what they rehabilitate, five centimeters lower. But you can't go with a clock to anthropos, you know, to, to buildings with five centimeters, too much. And this was uh, around uh, the, the air was, uh, is still one hectare. It means uh, two acres, I think. Yes, two acres and a half. Two acres and a half. Multiplied by five centimeters uh, concrete. Mm. Who, <laughs> who got the money? of these tons of concrete and this is happening every time so, so <coughs> control of the use of the money countries rich countries brackets, are spending for Africa must be must be very really strong must, must be strong and must be organized and uh, we have to help them but we have to control what's happening that's what we, Antwerp is helping Matadi Arbor, Antwerp is getting money from the cooperation, but there is, like I told you, there is no cent visible for the Congolese. Well, they build uh, anthropos and uh, they, they build a very, very many, many things in Matadi, bridge and things like that, but the Congolese had nothing to do. Same thing with the Arbor of Brussels. This is an, an internal Arbor, which is, Rehabilitating Kinshasa, it's the same. They don't see the money, but it works. Mm -hmm. And we give them the, their cranes and the <laughs> their machines back in order. And we say, okay, you manage the machines, but uh, you, you don't see the money. Do you think, you think you're starting to build trust? Though? Pardon me? Are you starting to build trust through them because you said you didn't trust them? 
do you think they're starting to trust you because you're doing something? Well, uh, well, they trust us because we do something. Yeah. They see it. Uh, that's 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 all. But we don't trust them in when they handle in money. We yeah. don't trust them at that time. Yeah. That's a new a new way, should I say? And uh, I think it's uh, the the way that the the World Bank and the international monetary funds and uh, the Europe should should go on, I should on, go on this way. Try to keep your money and control your money by yourself, and don't give the money to the government. Don't give the money to the institutions until they are able and they prove that they are capable to manage it on an honest way, which is not the case now.